Welcome everyone to Graceway Baptist on Capitol Hill. I'm Pastor Brad Wells, and today, from the Word of God, we are going to be talking about how to be happy. Now, everybody gets happy for a season, but we're talking specifically about how to be stable in your joy, how to keep a happy heart in a sad world. Now, we're going to be in Psalms 119. Last week, we did four points about how to have a clean heart. And this week, we're going to the second four verses there in that little paragraph about joy and happiness. You can have the joy of the Lord, which is the strength of our countenance. So let's stand together and begin by worshiping and praising our Savior. Thank you, Pastor. We're singing, I stand amazed. You can't be seated. There's a few people sitting down there. You can't be seated when we sing, I stand amazed. Sing with some gusto, some energy. Here we go. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And I wonder how we can know a sinner. Take a minute, say hello to your neighbors. Say, it's good to be in church. How are you doing with this massive lack of sleep today?
it? Brother Tiger, come on in. All right, everyone, welcome to Graceway Baptist Church. We have a thriving in-person ministry and also a thriving online ministry. So if you're online, thank you for joining us as well. We do have a bulletin here, and so please take a look. And as you do so, I took a poll this week, and 100% of the people were angry that the tent fell on their head. I took the poll, and 100% of the people, there we go. I know I had to explain. Thank you for sticking with me. Where's Joe? Is that okay? Mm, all right. That's not in the bulletin. There are real things that are in the bulletin, and so please do check those out. The makes are a missionary family of the week, so please do pray for them. And you do say it make, not Mac or mock, which I'm really tempted to do as a pilot. But do pray for them in the Ivory Coast. And then we do have services midweek on Thursday. Every Saturday night, if you're not in the habit of doing so, join us for the uh, Supreme Court prayer at 7 o'clock to pray for our nation and our leaders. And you're here on Sunday, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock services, and then Sunday school at 10 we do have an app, and so I would recommend that you get the app and also realize that we are developing, we being the royal we and certainly not me, a new app <laughs> that will be a bit more Gucci and have everything that you need to know, including something that's not on the bulletin, which is a teen activity for boys and girls next Saturday on the mall at 4 p.m. And so come talk to Tori if you're interested in that. You'll meet at 4, he'll have more details where, and then you'll stay until 7 and then join up at the Supreme Court to pray for our nation and our leaders. What is on the bulletin is that Capital Connection is this week, led by Independent Baptist Church in Clinton. And the first service on Monday is at 6 p.m. if you're in the habit of going to the evening services. And then Tuesday, Wednesday are at 7. And then there are a couple of important outreaches that are on the bulletin as well that are on Easter weekend. And on the Friday and Saturday of Easter weekend is some chance to do a gospel blitz into the neighborhood. Please see Brother Dan for that. If it's Friday, it's 6 to 8. And if it's Saturday, it's 11 to 1. And if you want to sign up, the signups are out in the, uh, the foyer there. And then at the same time, there is also the outreach for the kids that you see there listed from 11 to 1 on Saturday. So please be a part of one of those activities on Saturday or on Friday, and just a great chance to get the gospel out into the community so then they can come to church on Resurrection Sunday and understand the amazing truths of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We do have a Bible reading plan. I hope that you're in the zone of reading through the Bible with us. And I always have a quiz from the previous week's Bible reading. And the one that really struck me, the quiz, came from Numbers 1. We transitioned from Leviticus to Numbers this week. And they took a census or a survey in Numbers chapter 1, but not of all of the tribes or all of the members of the tribes, but a certain subset of the members of those tribes. What was the subset? Yep, those that could go to war, which was defined as males 20 and above. And that was for all tribes except one, the Levites. And I find it interesting as I consider that because actually this issue is in the news today as the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel do not have to serve. They're not mandatory to serve in their military. And that was originally when Israel was founded in 1948 so that those 400 ultra-Orthodox Jews could study the Torah as they were almost exterminated during World War II. But now that group in Israel has risen to about 13% of the population. And now they can't be conscripted into the military. They actually get a stipend to study the Torah. And there's a bit of a conflict now as Israel mobilizes about whether that should continue to be the law. But in the law of the Lord, back in Numbers, it was the case that everyone other than the Levites, 20 and above male, would serve in the military. And that is the trivia question of the day. Tori, back to you. Awesome. I feel so much smarter now. I didn't know that. Um, thank you for bringing that. I'm looking forward to next week with another gold nugget of truth. Uh, let's stand together, and we're going we're gonna to sing uh, a brand new song, introduce a song called The Lord Almighty Reigns. Maybe you know it. If you do, sing it nice, nice and loud. If you don't know it, learn it quickly right now and sing it with us. I want to just uh, say a quick verse, Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, kind of where this song 
originates from. A voice came out of, the th- out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let's sing, The Lord Almighty Reigns. sing together before pastor comes and preaches and this is a prayer to the lord and oftentimes i sing this to myself alone you know it's good to sing with other believers it's very important to sing with other believers but this is one of these where you can just sing by yourself when you're going through some stuff and you need to rededicate yourself to the lord Think about what you're singing. We're we're talking about occupy my lowly heart, own it all, and reign supreme.
let's have the music keep playing. I want to take a minute and just uh, give you a moment to pray to the Lord, ask the Lord to speak, speak to you today. Does God own you? Does he own your heart, every part of it? Does he reign supreme? Speak to us today. Speak to me. Speak to my heart today. And I pray that we would not reserve any part of our heart in our life for ourselves, but we would give it all to you. You would own it all. You would reign supreme in our lives today. And it's your name I pray. Amen. Let's sing that second verse one more time into the third. I was blinded. I was blinded by my sin. Take your Bibles, if you would, and let's go to Psalm 119, right there in the middle of the Bible, and really the longest psalm and chapter of the Bible, 176 verses. It's beautiful. The number eight is stamped all over this magnificent poetic work about the balance of human responsibility and divine sovereignty. There's 22 stanzas of eight Hebrew um, letters, um, all corresponding there. Well, they don't really correspond there in English for us, but in Hebrew. And it speaks of uh, the name, eight different names of the Word of God, eight symbols of the Word of God, and eight responsibilities to the Word of God that we have. And a beautiful acrostic there. But today, I want to talk to you about how to keep, how to maintain, how to keep a happy heart in a sad world. This world is filled with sin, and therefore it's filled with sickness and sorrow. And if you, if I, am going to have a happy heart, I've got to have something more than what society can hand out. And this last week was... A big week. We had a major Supreme Court decision. Of course, we had Super Tuesday, the State of the Union address, and then the forced sale of TikTok. And everybody's kind of divided in what's going on, what's happening, and there's a lot of confusion. But this psalm 
is, is solid, and it's all about how to have continual victory over sin. Not just occasional victory, not just um, uh, I repent and I get right and then I'm kind of dog paddling for a little while and I sink and the lifeguard comes and rescues me yet again. But you can have continual, you can have continual victory over sin. And when you do, you can be happy, healthy, and holy before the Lord. Body, soul, and spirit. That's what God wants us to have in this life. Now, sometimes sickness does come. And I, won't, I don't want to say that God doesn't allow sickness. God sometimes allows sickness, and he will give the grace to get through those problems. Every problem that the Lord allows in your heart or in your life, he will give an additional installment of grace and power to get through that thing. Now, we're going to talk about our heart. And when the Bible speaks of the heart, it speaks of your ability to make decisions, your will. It speaks of the true center of who you are. Really, from the biblical perspective, the brain is what your heart thinks with. So I want to give you a few verses, and we looked at some of these last week as we talked about how to keep a clean heart in a dirty world. Today we're talking about how to keep a happy heart in a sad world. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That word keep there speaks of guarding it. Like you would keep something very valuable. You wouldn't just take maybe if you had $10,000 in cash. I was going to use an illustration of $100, but that would only buy you a stick of gum. So if you had $10,000... Or a large sum, something valuable. You wouldn't display it to everybody. You wouldn't carry it in such a way that everybody walking down the street could see it. You would keep it. That is, you would guard it, that you would treasure it. And your heart is to be protected. It shouldn't just be open uh, to everything coming and going and whatever somebody wants to install in your thinking process, in your will. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That is, your thoughts influence greatly who you are becoming. That's actually who you are. Uh, it's been said, you're not what you think you are, but what you think you are. Romans 8 and verse number 6 says, for to be carnally minded, and carnally meaning physical, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So how is your mind today? How is your thinking process? What is your will set on, your emotions set on? Is it something that death can take away? then you're carnally minded. Is it spiritually? Is it spiritual? Then it can bring you peace and true life into your being. Colossians 1 and verse number 21 says, And you who were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, now hath he reconciled. So when Christ died on the cross, he died to bring peace between us and heaven. The way humanity thinks and the way God has established everything. That is, the wicked works affect how we think. We know that. You can see a kid and they look have a guilty look and they can't hardly hide it. And you know somebody's been in the cookie jar or done something wrong. And you don't know what it is, but there's something that has created this gap, this alienation. And we've become enemies with our parents as kids, or we become enemies with God by the way we think. And this 
world is filled with this brokenness. And if you're not careful, that depression can come into your life. We are very, very prone to all the sickness, sorrow, and sadness in life. I'll go further and say that there is a tsunami of sin and just sludge that is coming and knocking daily at our digital door. Now, there's always been this garbage out there, but we haven't carried it around with us and have access to it. Uh, you always had to go over in the bad section of town and over there across behind that alley and over there and, ooh, don't go over there. And maybe you might even think about going there, but you can't go there because it's... But now, in the privacy of our little devices that we carry around. Listen, we need to be serious about following the Lord. And God knows our mind and our hearts and our thoughts are very, very important. Now, for thousands of years, people have tried to control their thoughts and try to keep themselves happy. As a matter of fact, major amounts of money can be made on trying to sell people happiness. As a matter of fact, um, People can try to sell anything from cars to, to food to clothing by selling happiness. Um, when I was a kid, um, Coca-Cola had a little slo sl uh, slogan, and probably you remember it. Have a Coke and a smile. Nobody remembered it. How many of you remembered that? Okay, we got about five or six of us. Have a Coke and a What are they selling? Well, if you buy this then you feel good. And I want that smile, so whatever it takes to get there. Well, Psalms 119 actually shows us how to have real joy and real happiness in this life. And I want to say, in this generation, in this time, with all this advancement, we've actually, we've actually went backwards in true happiness. We've went backwards in sustaining joy. So today, how to keep a happy heart in a sad world. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't miss this. You need this. Don't miss this, okay? All right, here we go. Uh, number one, I want you to jot this down. It is my public declaration of the truth. It's absolutely vital. You have a public declaration that needs to be made of the truth. I'm going to give you four points directly corresponding to the four truths found in the latter half of Psalm 119. Verse 13, with my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. That is, my lips speak, my lips say, my lips declare what God's word says. It is absolutely vital. Now, you know this. Uh, salvation is described very clearly in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. That if thou shalt what? Confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So what you say affects you. As a matter of fact, this verse indicates that what you say affects your heart. And that so eternally. Salvation is two things, A and B, and I think they're right there together. Because you can have a false profession, obviously. But confessing with your mouth and believing with your heart. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 11, there is this church that is being attacked, and I think it's the first century, I think it's the tribulation, and honestly, I think it's uh, you and me today. And the Bible says that they overcame these attacks by the devil, by the blood of the Lamb, that is speaking of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, and by the word of their testimony. Not the word of the testimony of Christ, the word of their testimony. Well, what does that mean? It means I repented of my sins. I put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can overcome uh, the opposition before them. So 
We're saying here, Psalms 119, verse 13, with my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. When you testify and when you witness, it has a profound effect on your heart. You need to testify. You need to be a witness in public. This is a public declaration. Now, I remember the first time this happened to me, I was 19 years old. Now, I was raised in church, and um, dad was a deacon, dad was an assistant, dad was doing all sorts of different things in church, so we were always there and, and everything, and, and it was, um, I had, I was the song leader in the youth group, and I did various little things, and, but all of my testimony, all of my witness was in the safe confines of church and youth group and with all that good support when we went to new guinea as missionaries and i was 19 years old there was a there was a man named ron that came over about once a year uh, for several years in a row to do building he was a, a contractor from georgia and he spent a lot of time and money coming over and building churches and he came and so ron came and um, I was just sort of hanging out with him. He's about 10 years older than me, I would guess. And um, he just, there was about five or six guys standing in this median in between the post office on one side and kind of the, the central little trade store on the other side. And he said, Brad, would you translate for me? Can you, can you do that? And I was like, yeah. And I thought we were going to go over and talk to these three guys and he was going to say something about the Bible or something. So I'm ready. I'm like, yeah, let's do that. But no, that's not what he did. He stood up and began to speak boldly and publicly and then looked at me. And I went, oh. and just for a minute, destabilized, and then I matched his voice and cadence the best I could and translated for him. When that happened, there was more than three guys. There was a bunch of guys. All these people came around. As a matter of fact, I don't think this is a, uh, I'm inflating these numbers here, but I think there was probably close to 100 people that gathered and began to listen, and Ron preached a little salvation message, and I translated for Ron. I would have never chosen to do that. But Ron asked me to do it. I didn't quite understand, and it was just in the moment. And something happened to me, something wonderful happened to me that I think of, has influenced me to this day and why I'm standing here. I publicly declared the truth. Amen. And that public identification stabilized me. Now, I know what it's like to be unstable. To be unstable means to be very solid one minute <laughs> and the other way the next minute. I know all about that. Uh, let me say, here's a few things. When God prompts you to do something for the Lord, I want you to remember these four little, little things. Number one, don't delay. Now, had I delayed and said, you know, there's probably a better place than right here or a better time, Honestly, there probably was. But don't delay. Number two, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. How many of you are pretty good at the calculus of all these situations and have a tendency to overthink things? Yeah, me too. Don't delay. Don't overthink it. Number three, don't depend on them. Now, I told you about the three guys and then a whole bunch of people came and maybe as many as maybe 100 or something. Had I be, been dependent upon them, I'd been in trouble because all they did is stare and look. They were listening. But if I needed them to affirm me as a speaker or a Christian or anything, I wasn't going to get it and don't depend on them. Number, number four, don't add anything to it. And by that I mean this. We know and believe that the word of God has, has power, the power of the word of God, the gospel to save and to change lives. We believe, how many of you believe that? Yeah, we believe that. 
But we also think this. Now, if I can add charisma to that, if I can add humor to that, if I can add, you know, whatever I've got, now the power of God is going to be greater. And that's not true. Now, I think we ought to do the best we can. I, I studied, I prepared, I, I tried to think of these little illustrations and this sort of stuff. But the potency, the changing power, ability of God's word is not dependent on me. That's right. I'm to be a pipeline. I'm to be a channel that brings it to our group and our crowd. And that's what you're supposed to be. So you're not dependent on the rest of the people, but we are dependent upon the Lord. There's an old song. I don't know that I've ever sang it in church. I actually heard uh, a preacher give this illustration when I was a kid, but I have hummed this tune in my head many times before I would preach. And that is a song called Channels Only. And it goes something like this, channels only, blessed Savior. And it's speaking of God. Use me, I don't got it, but you do, and use me to connect your truth to these people. Be a witness. Something happens when you decide to take a public stand, a public declaration of the truth. Now, you need to witness to others, but you also need to witness to yourself. Many times I have had to encourage myself and I've had to say something like, I'm bought with a price. I will glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are the Lord's. I belong to Jesus. Many times, and you will have to do that. Witness to yourself. I belong to God. I've made my decision. You know that song. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Witness to yourself. Now, there's a, there's a third part of this witness element, and that is when you get crazy thoughts. Now, by crazy thoughts, sometimes you might be confused and think, why did I think that? The Bible actually speaks of that as a fiery dart of the devil, the wicked one, your adversary, and, and take it personally because it's meant personally, your adversary, the devil, is trying to destroy you. And the Bible speaks of him shooting darts, arrows, spears, weapons into your mind. And you'll have these crazy thoughts. I think suicidal thoughts are fiery darts of the devil. I think murderous thoughts are fiery darts of the devil. I think perverted thoughts are fiery darts of the devil. And you're like, what? where did that come from? It's the devil putting things into your mind. Now, <clears throat> you need to be careful. Sometimes you'll hear preachers are, are kind of guilty of this. We kind of rally ourselves and in our own maybe pride, maybe our own ignorance, start chiding the devil and insulting the devil. And, and actually, I'd like to do that because I feel that. But I want to show you two verses, and I, I want you to jot this down. Jude 1 and verse number, well, 8 and 9. It, it speaks about a, a problem of, of Christians doing this. And it says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And here's the part I want you to get. What did Michael do when fighting with the devil? Spiritual conflict. Durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Be careful with a railing accusation against the evil one. Deborah and I were brand new married about maybe six months, and uh, we were in Boise, Idaho. We would be going to um, uh, New Guinea soon, and we were working in a poor neighborhood uh, trying to bring kids to church. And there was a there was a house 
with these two humongous dogs, humongous, fierce dogs. And they had put big collars with spikes on these dogs. And there was just a, a fence, a chain link fence like this. But there was a boy that would taunt these dogs. And he would bang on the thing with sticks. And the dogs were around the corner. And then he'd bang and rattle it and then run away. And the dogs would come charging. And they were usually on... Um, uh, not chains, but cables, and, and they would slobber and drool and growl, and he would taunt those dogs and taunt those dogs. The owner would come out and yell at those kids. Now, the kids were running down the streets. Don't do that, and they thought they were the coolest kids. They thought, yeah, see those big dogs and get them all fired up. We're safe. We're protected from these, this fence, and that guy is yelling at him, and he's cussing at him, and he's and they thought they were getting away with something. Now, this story doesn't end in a bad way. They're, they didn't get out or anything like that. <laughs> but in my mind, I was like, that's like me with the devil. Now, it is true. The devil's behind there. And, but listen. Listen. The devil is fierce, and yes, he is that wicked, and yes, he is that doomed, and yes, he is that perverted, but don't, don't taunt the devil. That's what this is saying. So what do I do? Well, I'm glad you asked that. James chapter 4 and verse number 7. Please note this verse. James 4 and verse 7 shows you the two-step punch. Here it is. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Number one, I submit to God. Pride is your enemy. Name dropping is our poison. Pride and name dropping, listen, it will draw you in. I'm a preacher. This week I was preparing this message. I was working there at the Capitol and I was with somebody started dropping some names and you know what was right? I mean, it was coming out of my mouth I've got names to drop too, buddy. Here we go. And it was coming. And I was like, oh. And you know what the solution is? Humble yourself. Humble yourself. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves. That pride, that arrogance. You should accept me. You should be uh, impressed with me. That is your poison. Humble yourself. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. To God, I humble myself. To the devil, I resist him. I'm not provoking him. I'm not taunting him, but I am resisting him. The Lord rebuke you, and the devil will run from me. Now, sometimes we'll say, I'm not afraid of the devil, but that's not the question. The question is, is the devil afraid of you? Only if you humble yourself. You humble yourself before the Lord and he will flee from you. He will flee from you. Absolutely. So number one, my public declaration of the truth. Now, many of you, because I know I was raised in church, have not made a public declaration of truth. Now, you're a Christian. You're not ashamed of being a Christian. But all of your declarations have been in the safety of a support group, church, church maybe a Bible study, friend group. I want to encourage you right here and now, make a public declaration of the truth. It'll change you. It'll stabilize you. Or our subject today, it will keep you in joy or it'll give you a happy heart as you identify with God and his word. You can have a happy heart in a sad world. Number two, number two. What do I do? We're in Psalms 119. Here it is. Jot this down. My personal evaluation of the truth. Not only a public declaration, but a personal evaluation of the truth. Now, verse number 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Now, there's several ways that we could develop this or unpack this. But I think a very accurate way is that this, this word estimation or evaluation of the truth. 
Proverbs 23 in verse number 23 says this. It says Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Now that's what college is. We are buying instruction. Um, I take a special class. I go hear a lecture. I get a little bit more understanding. I experience some things. I work for a year. I intern. I take this position. I fall. I stand up. I get back up. Now I've got a little bit of wisdom. But in life, every day, you are a bit of a truth broker. And you take God's eternal truth, and when you apply it in your life and decide to keep it, you're buying it. And when you decide to say, I think that was for the last century. I think that was for a thousand years ago. I mean, that's quite antiquated, isn't it? We are selling it. The problem in this world, the problem in this world is not with the perverts. It's not with the pornography industry. It's not with liars and murderers and corrupt politicians. The problem is with the church of the living God. If we will buy the truth and keep it and hold it, the power of God will be released in our public testimony. How effective are you? Am I going to see somebody come to Christ this year because of what I'm doing? Listen, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. He wants to use your story and your personality. He wants to use your experience and your everything. He wants to use it. And every one of us. And we don't need this special skill and we don't need this special. You just need to say, God, I'm yours. Use me and God will take you up on it. He'll use you with a public declaration. But you need to make a personal evaluation of the truth. Well, actually, you are, whether you want to or not. You are. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 24 through 26 speaks of Moses' personal evaluation of the truth. And you remember Moses was born into a group of people that were oppressed, that were enslaved, and actually there was a, there was a genocide going on. All the baby boys were being thrown in the river. And Moses' mother made a little ark of safety out of some, some weeds and, and some pitch and, and stuck her little baby in there and had her oldest daughter, Miriam, stand by the side of the river over by the bulrushes and watch baby Moses. And Moses is kind of bobbing along there in the Nile River. And Pharaoh's daughter comes. And Pharaoh's daughter, see, they, they take the basket. There's a baby inside. The baby cries. Her heart is given to this baby. This is a Hebrew baby. Miriam appears out of the bulrushes. Oh, lucky me. I just chanced by. Uh, do you want me to go find a, a nurse for this baby? Oh, yes, please. Okay. And brings her mother. And You know the amazing story. And Moses is raised right in the, the Pharaoh's home. But when he came to years, by faith, and listen, life is all about faith. Faith is the commodity of heaven. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Could I do that? Could I refuse wealth and nobility and power, prestige and honor? Look at verse 25. Choosing. How can I refuse? And I can barely refuse this little tiny sin. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Quick question. Is sin fun? Everybody's like, oh, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> does sin have pleasure? Oh, it does. It surely does. But it's short, it's only for a season. 
And we are so bound by time and we don't understand. We are made, we are eternal beings that are just for a moment in this life with this body. We are not a body with a soul. We are a soul that for now has this body. And he chose. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproaches of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. What did he respect? What did he respect? He respected that God is going to be a debtor to no man and God will repay. And I want to tell you, without stutter or stammer, by the authority of the word of God, God will repay you. You need to make the right choice. This week, you need to esteem the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the wealth of wherever you work. Whatever that next rung in the ladder is. Whatever the greatest potential that you could imagine I could land this job and hold this position. I can have this much money. I can have this much control and power. Moses had that. Moses had it. He said, I choose Christ. That's what we've got to choose. Church, we must choose the things of God. Choose God's eternal truth. You don't have to eat out of a garbage can and be filled with uh, anger and shame and only that false pride holding you up because you're so embarrassed of what you're, what you're doing. You need to esteem, you need to estimate the words of God greater wealth than all these things. Greater wealth. Let me give you a few things here real quick. Um, so Emily, why don't you pop up some of these verses as we go and we'll see... Um, how this works out. See, the word of God is my uh, purifying anointing, my cleansing, the, the soap of my life. In verse number nine, uh, look at verse number 24. And um, this speaks of the word of God is my counsel when I'm confused. Let's read this together. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors, where do you run when you don't know what to do? Where do you run where there's, there's a difficult decision? Turn to the word of God. Verse number 54 speaks of my song all along life's journey. Let's read this together. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Let your life, let your home, let your heart be filled with the songs of Zion. The word of God should be my continual feast from Psalm 103. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You know Psalm 105 speaks of my lamp and light along thy way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Wow. Wow. It's very similar, verse 130 of Psalm 119. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. I have felt that. I've been confused. I've felt darkness or sadness creep into my heart. And I've turned to the word of God, maybe physically and read it, or maybe just in my memory. And I have felt the light of the word of God illuminate my heart. God's word is truth. It's a compass. It, it'll clean you. It'll direct you. It'll sustain you. It'll help you. It can be your song. It can be, verse 162, the greatest treasure of your life. The Bible says, I rejoice at thy word. Let's read it together. As one that findeth great spoil. Think of finding a quarter in the couch. Man, I used to get excited about that. Woohoo! Uh, think about finding some great treasure, some amazing thing. I rejoice at it. Look what I found. Listen, it's in the Word of God. It's in the Word. It's for you. But you're going to have to look. You're going to have to seek. God's going to show you. 
It's my identity and enduring heritage. Verse 111 speaks of God's testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever. They are the rejoicing of my heart. You have a heritage. It's right there for you, but you're going to have to take it. You're going to have to ask for it. You're going to have to say, God, I want this. So number one, my public declaration. Number two, my personal evaluation of the truth. Now number three, my persistent meditation on the truth. Now this is verse number 15, and we're just mining out the the truth of these four verses, just unpacking it. It's right there for us. Verse number 15, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I'm going to meditate. Now, last week we spoke a little bit about memorization and hiding God's word in our heart. Now that's important, but meditating is that next step. To memorize is kind of like to take it into your body or into yourself. But to meditate is when you start your your gut, your system starts assimilating the word of God. And think of a of a cow. A cow eats grass. Now, there's incredible protein in that grass. But people that eat salads aren't usually looking for high-protein meals. Although there is protein in there, we don't get it out. We consume it, but we don't have the gut, the stomach that can mine out that protein like, like a cow. Now, a cow can. It's an amazing thing. It's just like the Word of God. You can memorize a verse and I think probably most all of us have memorized John 3.16 and other verses. But until you start thinking on it and chewing on it, meditating on it, why does that word come before that word? Now, wait a second. But that verse says that. Once you start doing that, now you're assimilating. You are taking the nutrients into your body. It's not the food that you just consume. It's the food that you assimilate that will help you and change your life. Now, meditation is is much like that. Meditation is much like music in your mind. You ever get a tune in your mind, and I mean, that little song, that little ditty is just, you're driving yourself crazy. You're whistling it. You're driving everybody else crazy. Hey, what are you doing? And, And it's just in there. Now, you need to be careful because you can get the wrong stuff going through your mind and you are chewing on the wrong stuff. I've had that happen. And you can't try not to do it. That doesn't work. Because we're we're not built to to think that way. You have to replace it. You got to replace it. Um, Man, I'm thinking about the, the new song we learned today. That hallelujah. And that's just amazing. Chew on that. Get on. Get something and, and, and be careful what you're allowing to go into your mind. And be careful those little things that are buzzing around. Now, you are going to come in contact with some little things and you need to escape. And the way you will escape is purposeful, persistent meditation. Now, here's how you meditate. I'm going to give you three quick things. Number one, you need a sacred time to meditate. Set a time. This is where I think about the words of God. Maybe it's um, this evening. Sunday evening is a great time to think about the word of God. Go home, you take your notes, and these are the things that I'm, I'm trying to remember and think about it. Wait a minute. That preacher said that. That can't be right. Maybe it is right. Maybe it's not right. How do I apply that? Meditate. A, a specific time. Set a time to meditate. Number two, you need quietness. You are not going to be meditating while you're, you know, surfing the channels. You are not going to be meditating while you're in the middle of a death scroll on Facebook, okay? That you are not meditating. You need quietness. In some busy place, sitting at a table in, in Starbucks, no. You're going to be thinking everyone else's thoughts. And that's honestly, that's what social media is. It's a, a list of a thousand, a million, I don't know, however many thoughts. 
And they're saying, think this, think this, think this, think this. And our mind can, be so, can become so fragmented. You need to just push all that away and think your thoughts. I, I love to drive with no music and no podcast. And I've got so many thoughts, I hardly have time to think my own thoughts, let alone everybody else's thoughts. And I'm like, those are great thoughts. Those are amazing thoughts. But I've got some thoughts too. That's really what meditation is. And you're like, there's some things I really need to chew on and work through. You need a sacred time. You need some quietness. And you need concentration. One, I, I want to kick social media just a little bit more here. One of the problems with social media is <clears throat> simply that you lose your ability to focus and concentrate. And remember, education is not just getting knowledge or facts. It's learning how to think. And if you are giving yourself to these different platforms, your mind becomes fragmented and you are unable really to hold your own attention. And you're over, and over here. No, I'm, this is what I'm doing so what are those three things? I said a sacred time, some quietness, and concentration. Just like a, a cow chewing its cud there under the tree in that beautiful meadow, or just like music in your mind. Now this is going to help you when you're attacked. Verse number 23 of Psalm 119 says, Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Listen, it's not a waste of time to wait on God. You're not wasting your time waiting on God. This, this is a good defense. This is a good refuge for your soul. Speaking of your hands, your abilities, your skills, in verse number 48, my hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved. I will meditate in thy statutes. Now, hands are a symbol of learned skills, God-given abilities, strengths, activity. And God blesses what people do. And so, God, I'm giving you my hands. I'm lifting up my hands to you. And I'm <laughs> meditating on thy statutes. Verse 97 says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Now, that will lead us right into our last point. Point number four. I want to give this to you. I ask for your attention just for a little bit more. Number four, and jot this down, my purposeful appreciation of the truth. I remember my parents would get on me for being ungrateful. And I can remember even right now, at least one time, I was corrected for being ungrateful, which was not true. I just didn't say thank you. I was grateful. But we know if you don't have a plan or a habit of purposely saying thank you, writing a note, appreciating somebody, that opportunity is going to go right past you. You've got to purposefully appreciate the word of God. Now, verse number 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. You see that word? I will not forget thy word. I will. It's talking about my heart. It's talking about the center of my will. My spirit, what am I going to do? I am going to delight myself in thy statutes. I'm going to be happy in God's word. I'm going to delight myself, and I will not forget thy word. I'm going to remember it. Uh, you know Psalm 1. Say it with me here a little bit. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate 
day and night. Verse number two has got both those words in it. His delight and his meditation. My delight and my meditation. Now, here's what we do. We're going to come to church and we're going to do the word of God because this is our religion. This is who we are. This is our discipline. Like it or not, this is what we're going to do. Okay, that, that's a step, but that's, that's not the goal. The goal is I delight in it. Doing an interview, what do you love? Oh, I love the word of God. And it's a decision. I'm putting my will on it. Anybody that accomplishes anything has to do this. I will finish that race. I will lift this weight. I will finish this class. I will memorize this, whatever it is. Your will is very, very important. And here, the person that can have a happy heart in a sad world, that's our subject. How do I have a happy heart in a sad world, I will delight in the word of God. I am going to delight in God's word and what God thinks. And I'm going to meditate on it. Sun out, sun down. I'm meditating on the word of God. Psalm 37 and verse number four, elbow your neighbor and say, don't check out yet. Don't check out. Verse number two, it's um, uh, verse number four. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. You know what that's saying? It's not saying, you know, quid pro quo with God. It's not saying, oh, you give me your, your time, I'll give you. You know what it's saying? If you will delight yourself in God's, in the things of God, you won't be disappointed. All of life, money, Fame, power, education, um, wow, all these great things. If you set your will on it, your heart on it, you will be disappointed. You will be because they're hollow. There's only one thing. It's God, his eternal way, his eternal word. Psalm 40 and verse number eight. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. I'm delighting. I remember I was in New Guinea, and, and this last illustration will be done. I think I was 19. I might have been 20 years old. Things had just started ramping up in New Guinea. We had two or three churches kind of going. I say churches. I mean, it was just people coming and little temporary structures and it was exciting and I was riding with Steve Brogdon who was another missionary colleague of my dad's and he was just all excited and he said can you believe this this is so exciting these churches and we got these people they're wanting to go to Bible school and this is amazing and it was amazing but I said something to him. I, I meant it, but it wasn't true. But I wasn't lying or trying to deceive, but it wasn't true. And I said, that's easy for you to say. You're called here. I'm just a missionary kid. And I was inviting him to my pity party. And he flipped it on me quick. He just went, you know, Brad, you're right. Boy, I never thought of it. It must be really hard for you to be here. And I didn't sense any sarcasm. He might have been sarcastic, but I didn't sense that. And I went, the Holy Spirit in my heart just went, Brad, you're such a liar. This is the greatest privilege in the world. This is amazing. We were driving down the road. We were just coming to a corner. And there's a bunch of people selling all these little things on the side of the roads and kind of rough roads. And we went around the corner. It was a right-hand turn. And that was the turn to the right. It was the right turn in my life. 
And right there, I said to God in my heart, and then I soon said to Steve, I just went, God, I'm not a victim. This is a privilege. This is wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a missionary kid here. And that was another major change in my life, the turn to the right. Maybe you're here today and you need to make a right-hand turn. And it's a turn of gratitude. It's a turn of, God, I'm thankful. It's a turn of, I'm not a victim. It is a privilege to serve you. It is a privilege to have the Word of God. No matter who you are, no matter how much God's blessed you with, you can always find something to bellyache about. Stop. Be a happy sheep. How to have a happy heart in a sad world. I'll tell you, it's delighting in the Word of God on purpose. I love God. I love His Word. These are my people. I'm not ashamed of them. I love God's will. I love God's way. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to be it. That's what Psalm 19 is all about. Things that God does and things that I must do. It's my will. So where are you at today? I'd like to invite you to stand with me. The Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. When you lose the joy of the Lord, you have no strength. No strength against sin. No strength to stand. The fiery darts of the devil wipe you out. You're destabilized. God's people need to be stable. But they can only be stable on the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I love the people of God. I love the God of the Word. Jesus Christ died to save us from our sin and our sadness and our sickness and all the other plaguing things around us. If we'll humble ourselves, repent of our sins, and ask God, He will show us His way. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, we come before you painfully aware of our own failings, the lack of ability to concentrate, failure in meditating on your words, it seems like chronically we give ourselves to the very things that we hate and dis destroy us. So, Lord, we turn to you in desperate need, first for salvation. And as we're in this spirit and attitude of prayer, if you've never repented of your sins and put your faith and trust in Christ, I want, you, I want to invite you to do that right now. It, all you have to do is from the will of your heart, Say, God, I admit it, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've went my own way. Pride, I know about that. Arrogance, willfulness, rebellion against you, Father. I, I know it. But right now I humble myself and I repent of my sin and I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he lived a perfect life and died on the cross to pay for my sin. Rose again on the third day. And Lord, right now I'm asking you, you the Son of God, to forgive me of my sin and to save me from my sin and myself. God, save me. Would you just whisper that? God, save me. Lord, save me. And Lord, help me now to live a life that's worthy of you. Lord, help me to be filled with the Spirit of God. Help me to follow you. Help me to have that discipline to be your disciple. Lord, help me to be stabilized in the Word of God. 
and not be distracted running here and there and everywhere. But help me, Lord, to follow you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tori, would you come and lead us in this song? And maybe you want to just pray with your eyes closed in an attitude of worship. Maybe you want to jot something down that you need to remember. And maybe you want to sing this song as a prayer. But this is the application of the message. Maybe God's showing you something I didn't even say. But God showed you. Hold on to that. Whatever God showed you, hold on to it. Occupy my lowly heart and own it all and reign supreme. Conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me. Make me yours forever. I was blinded by my sin, had no ears to hear your voice, and did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. But then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me, through the gospel of your Son, gave me and peace. Help me now to live a life that's dependent on your grace. Keep my heart and guard my soul from the evils that I face. For you are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. Oh, great God, Close us in a word of prayer, sir. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I, I know the Lord has given us something, and uh, it is a privilege to serve with, with each of you. Brother Brian. So this, uh, this word today was uh, pretty timely, because uh, I'll say in my personal life, in my circles, um, I've had three people that I've known that have just checked out. Um, it's been a it's been a dark couple of weeks. Uh, folks have just not been happy, and I think that this message today, I hope, uh, resonates with us, and hopefully we can be a beacon in people's lives in a very, very dark and sad world that there is a better way, and there is God. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this word that was given today. I want to ask for your continued protection and guidance of our pastor as he provides this word for us as we go out into a very dark and sad world that he will provide the word that we will be able to apply it and be beacons of light to folks that need a better way, dear Jesus. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here today and bringing, uh, getting us safely here and hopefully uh, providing a hedge of protection for us to get home to our families and what we're going to do for the rest of the week. And we thank you for everything you've done for us. We are eternally grateful for, for the, what you do for us in our lives. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. God bless you.